think they hear me. They hear me? Wonderful. So for our Advent candle lighting, good news of great joy the angel said, for to you a savior is born. Peace on earth, the choir sang, for God reigns in the highest. Follow me, the star beckoned, for hope was born in Bethlehem. As we light the Christ candle, we watch for the Christmas story around us. Emmanuel has come and is coming. Come all ye faithful and worship God. Let us have our call to worship. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. For a child has been born to us, a son given to us. Glory to God in the highest heaven. Let us worship the Prince of Peace. And for our first hymn, A Carol of Christmas, O Come, All Ye Faithful.
Let us now be called to confession. We invite everyone to kneel or bow your head in praying together. Let us humbly confess our sin before God. O Christ, you were born in a humble stable because there was no room for you in the inn. Forgive us when we foolishly think that there is no room for you in our lives. When, when we, we close, close the, the doors, doors of our hearts to your word, forgive us and burst, and burst through them with your love. When, when we close the doors of our minds to your challenge, forgive us and burst through them with your love. Forgive us and speak your angels' words to us once more. Do, Do not be afraid. afraid. Amen. And now for our assurance of pardon. Like a great light in a land of deep darkness, the mercy of the Lord has shone upon us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Our first reading this evening is from Isaiah 9, verses 2 to 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us, authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time onward and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God.
the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, beginning with the first verse. This is the familiar Christmas story. Let us listen for the word of God. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended, descended from the house and family of David. He went, he went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, uh, tonight, as we uh, celebrate Christmas Eve, we, uh, we're in the middle of a, a COVID crisis. The entire world is suffering. Millions have sadly died from this disease. Many, many more are suffering. Uh, our nation seems to be in turmoil with our election. The United Kingdom and the European Union are in turmoil with, with Brexit. Where do we find good news in this story? Uh, I, there's a little bit of consolation in this story that uh, Mary and Joseph were also not in a great place on this night as God comes into the world, as the Savior of the world comes into, 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 the, in, in, into human form, uh, Mary and Joseph are in an occupied nation. There are Roman guards guarding their streets. They're paying taxes to a foreign government. And in the middle of all this, the Emperor Augustus demands a census be taken of all Jewish people. And Mary and Joseph, late in, in Mary's pregnancy, have to travel a long distance to Bethlehem. And if you think our technology today is kind of shaky, uh, the, imagine being a pregnant woman uh, traveling on a donkey from Galilee to, to Bethlehem. She, Mary was complaining about technology a lot on, on that travel, I, I guarantee you. And that is how God chose to come into the world. God didn't choose to come at the best of times. God came uh, when we, God was most needed, when the mercy of God was most needed. And where God came has is, is also been a, a, a source of, of wonder for, for ages. Uh, the Roman Empire was impressive. The Roman Empire had hundreds of historians recording everything Caesar did and, and said. Why didn't God appear in Rome? Why did God appear in some little tiny nation occupied by Rome where Jesus would get no press coverage at all? Uh, and, and seriously, when you, if you read every Roman historian, 
for the for 200 years before and after Jesus as far as we can tell Jesus is mentioned four times in the Roman Chronicles and never is there much detail given uh, one one historian says that Jesus's brother Jacob was executed unjustly we're not told who Jesus was except he, he was mentioned as the Messiah in in that in that reference uh, one time we're told that he was executed unjustly uh, and then a couple of other times his name is mentioned as the leader of a religion but nothing is said about that religion and so in all of Roman history official Roman history almost nothing was remembered of Jesus so why did God choose Judea Palestine why that place why that time uh, it's one of the great mysteries of God. It's one of those questions we may never answer, but we can, we can play with that question. Uh, we got a Christmas card this year from um, one of my wife's friends, or it's actually friends of all of us, but, you know, but uh, she, uh, we, we got a Christmas card, and as often we, people do, they get a nice letter along with that kind of thing that was going on in the family. And at the end of the letter, there was kind of a little, uh, a little bit of a political edge to that letter where uh, the writer was kind of complaining about what's going on in, in the world and what's going on in our nation, all the things uh, that, are, that are not quite as maybe we would like them to be. And, and in the middle of that, that little bit of anger in that paragraph, he said, in the middle of all this, where are the churches? We, we have children being taken from their parents and put in cages. We have a government that seems to be impossible to, 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 tell, to ever speak the truth about anything and why aren't the churches doing something about it and that's a really good question and I think it's a fair question to ask whenever there's any injustice whenever there's any suffering in the world people ought to be asking where are the churches well uh, Presbyterians have never really been comfortable at the national level you know, talking loudly on, on broadcast television uh, you know, maybe maybe back in the 1960s with the civil rights movement, we had some prominent people uh, fighting for civil rights. Uh, in the 80s, if you remember, our, the moderator of the General Assembly, John Fife, was the pastor of a church in Arizona who was very prominent in the, uh, the sanctuary movement. And he was actually arrested and found guilty, found guilty of helping people in the desert by giving them water and sentenced to five years probation. And he made national news when that happened, but he wasn't seeking national news. He was seeking to give water to hungry people wandering in the desert. So I think one of the reasons why we, we don't see our, our church, our Presbyterian church very often in national news is because we follow a savior who was born in a barn, not born in Rome. He was not born in the capital. He was not born to, to speak to, to Caesars and generals. He spent his life talking to poor people, to sick people, to prostitutes, to tax collectors, to sinners. For some reason, God felt that the Savior was needed by the common people more than by the leaders. Now, I don't want to say anything negative about it. Sometimes people of faith are called to speak at a national level. And, and sometimes that, that prophetic voice can be helpful. And I don't want to say anything bad about those people who are called to that. But when you think about it, maybe every generation, there's room for a couple of people at the national level, the Billy Grahams, the, the John Marshalls, not John Marshall, uh, Pastor Marshall, I'll call him, <laughs> I, forgot, I forgot his first name. Uh, but uh, but, uh, but there, there's not room for millions of Christians at the national level to be saying what they think. And I think we're not called to be saying what we think at the national level. Instead, we're called, as Jesus showed us, to be working in the streets, in our neighborhoods. We're called to be working with the common people. And, and when you ask that question, where are the churches? I guarantee you there, are, there were church people surrounding those kids in the cages demanding justice. Whenever there's a hungry people, a hungry person, a hungry family on the streets of San Antonio, there are opportunities to be fed by churches all over San Antonio and, and church organizations like Christian Assistance Ministry and Haven for Hope and, and the SAM Ministries. Uh, whenever someone needs housing in San Antonio, we have Habitat for Humanity that builds houses for homeless people. 
when, with veterans who have PTSD, our church has programs for veterans who need help. When you ask where are the churches, don't look on the national news. Instead, look in your neighborhood, because I guarantee you there are church people working in your neighborhood with the problems of your neighborhood, and they are meeting those, those, those needs in the neighborhood, or they're trying to every day. We may not make the national news, as Jesus never made the national news, uh, except you know, four times in the 200 years after he was living, but we are in people's lives every day. That, that's our goal. That's our, 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 our mission is to touch individual lives. We're not great at, at saying that loudly all the time, but we are good at doing it faithfully every day. And, and I know as, as a pastor, if we ever slow down, there's always somebody in the church who says, why aren't we doing that? You know, why can't we do more? There's always people calling for us to do more. And to me, that's really good news. That because we have this Savior born in a humble place to humble people in a humble nation, we're given permission to go everywhere. We don't need status. We don't need recognition. We don't need television coverage. We will do our job in a barn if we need to with one family. That is who we're called to be as the followers of Jesus Christ. So it's a fair question. Where are the churches? And I think it's a fair answer. Look on the streets any day of the week of any nation in the world, and you will find people of faith reaching out in love to people who need it. Is there enough of that? Can we do more? Yes, we can always do more. We can always do a better job. But we're there day after day, year after year, generation after generation, trying to show God's love. So don't look on television for what we're doing. Instead, look on the streets. That is where it counts. That's where millions, even billions of Christians every day are living their lives of faith because we have this Savior born in a manger 2,000 years ago. So let's give thanks to God for this humble story that reminds us that there is no place too humble for us to go. There is no mission too small. There is nobody on this planet too unimportant to need our love. Our job is to go to every place, every nation, every barn, every home, no matter how humble, and share God's love as it's needed in every place. Amen.
Okay, we're at our Lord's table, and we're hopefully having sound. Okay, great. But we gather at our Lord's table, and we invite you, to, to, if you have bread and wine available, and a moment to share with us as we celebrate this, uh, this gift from God. Let us pray together. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. People will come from east and west and from north and south and sit at table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at, at table with his disciples, he took the bread and the wine, broke the bread, poured the wine, blessed it, gave thanks to God. And it was then that their eyes were opened and they recognized him. So this is our Lord's table. It's not a Presbyterian table. Our Lord Jesus Christ invites all those who trust in him to share this meal. So let us pray together the great prayer of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Holy God, we praise you. Let the heavens be joyful and the earth be glad. We bless you for creating the whole world, for your promises to your people Israel. And on this night especially, we give you thanks for Jesus Christ, in whom we have seen the fullness of your love. Born of Mary, he shares our life. Eating with sinners, he welcomes us. Visiting the sick, he heals us. Dying on the cross, he saves us. Risen from the dead, he gives new life. And living with you, he prays for us. And therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. With thanksgiving, we take this bread and this wine and proclaim the death and resurrection of our Lord. Receive our sacrifice of praise as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us that this meal may be a communion in the body and blood of our Lord. Make us one with Christ and one with all who share this feast. Unite us in faith, encourage us with hope, inspire us to love, that we may serve as your faithful disciples until we feast at your table in glory. We praise you, eternal God. Through Christ, your word made flesh in the holy and life-giving spirit, now and forever. As we pray together the words our Lord Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after dinner, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. And every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again. Friends, this is the body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven.
This is the blood of Christ shed for you, the cup of salvation. Let us pray together. We thank you, O God, that through word and sacrament, you have given us your Son, who is the true bread from heaven and the food of eternal life. Strengthen us in your service, that our daily living may show our thanks through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, finally, on this night, as we celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus, we come together to the Christ light, and we light our candles from his light. So tonight as we sing Silent Night together, we invite you to light your candles at home, and remember that it is all light in our spirits, in our world, that comes from God to us through Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us tonight. Sorry for the technical problems, but we'll get there.
blessings to all of you this night. Thank you for joining us. And I hope, I hope that you enjoyed this and were able to worship God. It is so wonderful to see all of your faces. And if I could figure out how to unmute you all at once, I would, but I can't figure it out. So in order to say goodbye to each other, you'll need to unmute yourself. So thank you. Thank you. Good night. 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 Yes, <laughs> Feliz Navidad. Thank you all for joining us. As, as Sonia said, uh, oh, we go. Okay, we go. the birth of Christ, the coming of Christ into our lives today. Our world is in is as much in need of a Savior today as it was 2,000 years ago. So give thanks that we have a God who will come into the humblest of lives. And because of that love, let us go everywhere we can and share that love because of the Christ child we celebrate tonight. Amen. 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 Good to see you again. Merry Christmas. 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 Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Good night. Good night. Good night. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Love you guys. Love you all. Miss you all. Merry Christmas. Bye. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Can I leave the meeting? Give me a leave button. Come on, leave. Try to leave. There we go. Bye bye. Mine wasn't letting me leave.